Okay, good morning everybody. Um, welcome to the January Heads of Service meeting. Um, we're going to start in just one moment. Um, I hope you are all connected well and you can see the screen. Please let us know if there's any issues uh, in the chat box, but please put any questions in the question box for us. Okay, everybody, so good morning. Uh, so I'm Kath Lewis, I'm the president of the BAA, and I welcome you to the January meeting. We have quite a lot to cover this morning, so we'll just show you the agenda and the next slide. So this morning we're going to cover quite a number of things, the, the joint guidance update and we'll explain what we've done there if you haven't had a look already. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at some of our new board members and have some updates on the newborn hearing screening programme, uh, wax removal services, equality and diversity and inclusion, um, the um, higher training scheme, some early professionals, and we've got quite some um, important questions to ask you around the conference this morning. So please stay tuned and please do get involved when we um, we ask you to. That would be wonderful. OK, so let's start this morning with the joint guidance. Now, um, we revisited this uh, a number of times over the past month and that was just to check if there was any urgent amendments that were required, which we didn't feel there was. However, um, it was a plan to be reviewed on the 15th of January, which it was. Um, and some of the comments that uh, we received from members on all sides, just BAA, BSHAR as well, uh, around the confusion on the different uh, levels. So we changed some of that and I'll explain that in a moment. So um, we've continued to advise that uh, we are um, an essential service so we sh as far as we can do we should keep working and keep using the PPE as recommended we haven't changed any of that uh, the vaccine rollout doesn't remove that need to to be, uh, relax anything on the PPE at the moment okay well, the next slide please So what we've what we've done in the guidance now is we've changed the levels to stages. So we've got stage A to E, and these are the ones that you should follow. So that essentially this table is exactly the same as it was before. It's just that we've changed the, the levels to stages, just to take any confusion out around the government's um, alert levels, uh, because I think that was causing a little bit of confusion. OK, so I would recommend that you go. This is Appendix 9 of the guidance. And again, we did put out a statement because we had a lot of questions about it. Uh, a number of services contacted us asking for help um, uh, what they should be doing because they've been asked to close down. Um, so we put out a statement we felt that was needed to um, to just give some support really to everybody. So the national advice is that we do remain an essential service. Um, and uh, that's gone out on, that went out onto um, social media and also on, on our web pages, okay? So we've also put that, I think, in the uh, handouts box. So there's things uh, you can access there from today's meeting. Okay. So I um, wanted just to go over a little bit around the board. So in November, we had our AGM and I hope many of you were able to take part in that. Uh, if you weren't, I'll just uh, review what we did then. So we said goodbye to two long serving board members. So that was Sue Falkingham, who was, when I came into post, was the past president and Claire Benton, who was our uh, conference lead. 
and they put an awful lot of time and effort into um, you know doing an awful lot for, for, for BAA uh, especially around conference and a lot of the guidance that Sue was involved in um, I mean, Sue, Sue was on board for over 10 years. So, you know, that's a lot of volu time volunteering and a lot of time uh, and effort put into, uh, you know, helping BAA to progress. So we 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 do owe them uh, quite a lot. So thank you very much to Sue and Claire. I know Claire's on this morning. We also uh, said goodbye to two board members at the end of the term. So that was Charlotte, uh, who helped with our early professionals and Michelle Foster, who was our healthcare science board lead at the time. So we do thank uh, Charlotte and Michelle as well for everything that they put into helping on board. So we did have this year 16 people who put themselves forward and we now have some new faces on the team. So I want to introduce you to our new board members. So these are new directors. So we have Rebecca Anderson. Uh, Rebecca is now uh, taking over as Director of uh, Professional Development. So this is um, a new area that we wanted to develop more uh, for everybody, uh, looking at uh, continuing professional development, but other things as well and where we can support you. So Rebecca is leading on that and is doing a sterling job already. Dawn uh, Bramham has taken over. Uh, she's actually helping a little bit at the moment just with our healthcare science. Um, but I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Sarah's taken over on early professionals. Uh, Jason has now taken over uh, the service quality. And we have Lauren Willis, who is our membership director. So if we pull up the next slide, we can see where everybody is leading on board. So I'll just let you have a look at that for a moment. So Dawn is, is pubs and cons, so if there's anything that we need publishing um, or putting out on the media, she's involved with that. Heather uh, Dauber uh, is our policy and campaigns events lead, so this is a, another new area where we felt we needed to have a lot more influence. So this is about how we campaign for different things, uh, we're looking at the policy for BAA, and also about what events we might put on to uh, promote things a little bit more. Um, Barbara Gre Gre Craig is still our treasurer, thankfully, so she does a sterling job. And I know Sam has taken over as vice president, so and she's leading on the um, equality and diversity and inclusion. Susanna has now taken over a, um, a conference, and you're going to hear from Susanna a little bit later. Laura's doing our regional groups and she's going to talk a little bit later as well. Sarah's going to update you on the early professionals. Um, Lizanne uh, and Tim are still doing education and accreditation and registration. And as I said, Lauren's doing membership and she's also involved on the equality and diversity and inclusion. So these are the people that if you anything around those areas that you can contact. OK, so you can go through our admin at BAA Audiology and um, May, our PA, will put you in touch with the right person. Okay. So I'm going to now pass over to Jason and he's going to update you on the rapid review into paediatric audiology. Um, morning all, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, hopefully. Fingers crossed, uh, let me know if not. So um, basically, I think since our last talk to the head of service, this, this has come out. Um, so it was done because the future of newborn hearing screening in England in particular is in flux following um, PHE saying that they're going to be, well, the government basically disbanding PHE from April. Um, and so a sort of decision was made, well, actually, this is the right sort of time to start making representation to to NHS England and to the bodies in order to say, you know, we, we need this going forward and this would be better if we could have in place going forward. Um, so the panel was composed of representatives from the BAA, the BSA, BAR, BAPA, NDCS and ENT UK. So quite a broad spectrum of people from across the board to, to present recommendations. 
but it was designed to be broad, not the finer detail. So you will find that it, it's it, when you read it, it says more sweeping statements rather than actual physical. This is the fine detail. That, that's purely because our thought was this needs to be rapid, this needs to be quick, and it's not something that we can sit down and just really delve into the fine detail yet. The next slide, Vic. Um, so, in total, the four main recommendations of that review to come out of it and that have gone out is that there should be one national body responsible for the oversight of the whole of paediatric audiology from birth to the point of transfer to adult services and should have clinical knowledge of audiology embedded into it, including oversight of the newborn hearing screen, medical and scientific diagnoses, school screen, behavioural audiology and hearing aid services for children and their families. They, so at the moment, um, the pathway is incredibly fragmented. Um, in the sense that newborn screen is within PHE, the rest of audiology is within NHS England, some of that is commissioned locally with the CCG, some of it isn't, there's no oversight of the, the teachers of the deaf and that, that, that sort of educational provision and everything like that. So the idea was we, we really need one overarching body that can then disseminate information quickly to, to all the sectors. Um, and then the idea was that this body, once it's decided, should then define clear operational standards for services. So clarity of who's responsible for what, working with sectors across boundaries. And there should be specific targets for paediatric audiology with reporting separate from the RTT and the DMO1 returns. Um, and it should also define staff training requirements. So what does it take to be a paediatric audiologist? How, how sort of, what experience do you need? What sort of training is a good idea? Um, there should be clear joined up commissioning, so the, the newborn screening programme should be unbundled if possible from the maternity payment pathway and a realistic national tariff should be established for all procedures and pathways. So looking across the data from across the UK, that those two points come into the fact that actually it's impossible to tell what paediatric weights are like. You, you get the DMO1 figures, and the RTT figures, but they're all mixed in together with those. So it's impossible to actually say, well, here's my paediatric weight. Um, so the idea behind two is actually, you can't support services if you don't know which services are struggling. And then the idea behind three is that to have a decent tariff will enable, so th there is such a postcode lottery of tariff across the UK with some services getting nothing at all, for example, for their ABR follow up, some services getting like £500 per ABR. So the idea was let's sit down, let's establish a tariff. And then it was felt that um, a quality assurance scheme such as IQIPS should be mandated within paediatric audiology, but this scheme needs to offer both process and clinical level quality assurance. So the general feeling amongst the panel and amongst stakeholders and people we consented was that while IQIPS is a fantastic scheme, it tends to be more a process audit than a, than a clinical quality audit. And so it's less actually relevant for services than it, it could be. Uh, can I have the next slide, Vic? So, how did it go on? Well, it, it was very well received initially by NHS England. I would say less so in the early days by PHE, but much more so now following discussions and everything like that with them, that essentially it's about building services for the future. It, it's not about apportioning blame to what's gone in the past and everything like that. It is about building, building the services for the future. And we've had a formal reply now. Um, so whilst it, it, it took some time, and if anyone's uh, aware, there is a significant backlog within NHS England of formally replying to letters, but we, we have now had a formal reply, and meetings continue on the future and the way forward with NHS England and, and with PHE. Um, as, a, as part of my new role, the SQC of the BAA is going to start looking at what is good within paediatric audiology. And what I mean when I say that is, how do we find, how do we define what a good service looks like? Um, what are some practical tips for services on getting to that good service so that we have 
this sort of information that we can take off the shelf and feed into the, the later stages of the review when we do start to hopefully look at bringing in some of these targets and things like that. And um, work continues to raise the profile, um, but there is actually nothing official yet on where NHSP will go post PHE disband. So they haven't decided, as far as I'm aware, for any of the screening programmes, what the future of that looks like. They have decided they are disbanding PHE, um, and the, the initial stuff back in November was that they will be gone by the 1st of April. I think that's unlikely now, because at the moment they, it will require an Act of Parliament, and they still haven't decided where they're going to go. But we, we shall see what the future holds. And um, just a special thanks to all in the panel who helped with the, and to everyone in the panel, everyone who helped with the most rapid consultation ever, including some of the heads of department on this meeting, some of the, um, and some of the past presidents and bits on that of the BAA, and all the bodies who helped support it. Um, going forward and for the time being, I think it's really important to say that um, NHSP remains a critical service and um, we, we would recommend that even in now in the most trying of times that still the ABR follow-up from screen remains um, try, to, try to keep that in your service for as long as possible as open for as long as possible um, if you do need to shut down or you get any problems those documents that we developed in the early days have gone through some changes but they are all on S4H um, or on the BWA website and they can all be downloaded and they're just ready to go off the shelf. So that's me. Really. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to email me, feel free to come through the BWA, whatever, and we can we can answer those and carry on. Hi Jason, there's just a, a couple of questions that have popped into the a question box. One is probably for everyone else on the call if they can um, comment on the age. Um, the other paediatric audiology services are transferring to adults and there's also a question that do you think we will have to pay for IQIPS and the new paediatric QA system? I don't know if that's <laughs> something you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Um, who, who knows? Um, we are still in such early, early stages about it. Um, it it's really impossible to say. Um, I, I would hope that if you do have to pay for it it will be budgeted into the tariff for example to make sure that the, the tariff is more appropriate so that there is more money in the pot for services to, to support particularly as well if if we go for some training requirements for example there's going to need to be money for training and, and bits of ops like that um with so early days i can't really answer that um with regards to the age the, the idea behind the review was lots of people do transfer at different ages and sometimes it's not appropriate to transfer until they are technically adults. But within the, um, with, within the guidance from NHS England, adult is quite clearly defined at the point where a child becomes an adult. So that's why it is 18 within the, within the, uh, within the actual publication. Great. There's one more question before you disappear. Have you considered looking at the national paediatric QS in Wales and Scotland, which are part of the mandated tier one national audit in Wales? Uh, implementation has shown measurable improvement in services across Wales. Yeah, and, and that is entirely the point. Um, in, entirely the idea, basically, we're not going to rewrite the we're not going to rewrite the wheel here. We're not going to we're not going to reinvent it. We are going to take the best from each individual place look at what evidence is behind that, work with the NDCS, work with work with the multiple bodies would be the plan um, to, to work out what's best. Um, so yes, yeah, certainly we'll be looking at, there's some quite good evidence from Scotland as well of their, um, of their bits and bobs. So it will be sort of the best of Wales, the best of Scotland, the best of what we've got and have a look and see what we get. Thanks, Jason. Sorry, one other comment. Can the formal reply be shared with members? Uh, the, I, that's one for CAF to decide. Um, it's a, I don't know if we shared the initial letter. I'm not sure if we did or not. Um, I, can, I have no objection to sharing the formal reply with members, um, but it, it, it is to the BAA board, so it's not my decision.
I'll, I'll come in there, Jason. Uh, yes, I, I think it's we can share it. If you're if you're happy with that, we can put that up on our our site. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jason, for that. Um, I've been asked to put my camera on, so um, yes, but please uh, excuse <laughs> it's the way I look. But um, this is to help people who are struggling at the moment. So we've been trying to get captions on uh, desperately, um, but we've, we're finding now that as if Victoria speaks, her her, her voice is captioned, but nobody else is. So I don't know why that is. So we, we will find out. We, we really do need to be able to do this uh, captioning quite well. Um, we should be able to do it on my computer because it's a Mac, but it's, um, I think that the, the, um, the PowerPoint bit part of it is uh, not as up to date as it should be. So I apologise for that. So I'll keep the camera on. Uh, I want to come next to um, wax removal campaign. This is this is quite a thing for me. I'm I'm quite passionate about the wax removal part. So um, I'm not sure if you uh, many of you are aware. I think we did put something up about it on our website, but there was a um, there was a parliamentary written question at the end of 2020 about access to uh, wax removal services in some uh, commissioning uh, areas. Um, and the answer to that stated that earwax removal is an enhanced service that the CCGs and GP practices do not have to provide. And instead, that instead they can choose to commission this. Uh, and that's based um, you know, on service level and local need. So this, uh, I mean, we said that this contradicts uh, clinical evidence and the national guidance um, by suggesting GPs refer those who are struggling with their hearing due to earwax to audiology service for assessment and hearing aid fitting. So we then decided that we needed to, um, to, to actually put something together and campaign a little bit more around this. And, and the RNID, so Frankie who's going to come next after me, is going to tell you a little bit more about that. So I think this is something that we can campaign for. So we composed a letter and we're hoping to get that either in the handouts at some point or we will put it as an access for you on the website if you want to, to look at it. Um, we haven't heard back yet, uh, but that's not the end of the story. We will continue to do this. So part of it is, and, and Frank is going to ask you, is about what access is there out there? And I know in my area in, in Manchester, um, the commissioners have a um, little disparate um, commissioning around wax removal. So they have commissioned some. Um, some have, have been put in some of the uh, any qualified provider frameworks, um, but it's not the same everywhere. So it's about looking at the needs. So they don't see this as a great need for everybody. And we as audiologists know it is quite a big thing for us. OK, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to pass over to um, uh, Frankie from the RNID. So I'm going to introduce Frankie. So she's she's been great in, in helping us and we do we're going to do quite a few things together, hopefully. So I'm going to mute myself now and come off camera and I'll leave you to Frankie. Hi everyone. Oh, sorry. Let me put my right camera on. There we go. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for um, kind of giving me some time to talk about this today. Um, Kath has given like quite a good background of it. Um, I'll just go quickly over kind of my role within the RNID. So um, I am an audiology specialist. So I was working clinically before, but now I work in the research and policy team. So we kind of carry out social research around our and kind of develop policy positions and our campaigns. Just quickly, before I get on to WAX, um, some of you may be aware that up until November 2020, we were trading under the name Action on Hearing Loss, but we had quite a thorough consultation and rebranding process, and now we are back in up with our old name of RNID. Um, so as I mentioned, or Kath mentioned, the kind of background to why um, we're kind of doing work around this. We've also, through our helplines and kind of um, campaigns, inbox, all sorts of avenues, we've noticed a big increase in people inquiring about getting wax removed. So people are not able to get it done at their DP surgery. They're also um, unable to afford private removal as well. Um, so we've in, kind of received inquiries like this before the pandemic, 
um, but not on this scale. Um, and probably the reduction in face-to-face -face appointments with GP surgeries as a result of COVID-19 has probably had quite a big impact on this. Um, so what we're doing about this uh, basically, we want to capture a bit more information about what's going on. So we've developed a web page that kind of complements our uh, existing advice on wax um, and how to get it removed. But we've also kind of made some more information about what's actually happening uh, with the current situation around the parliamentary question and what um, yeah the Department of Health and Social Care are saying. Um, so. This page allows people to take action. We want people to enter their postcode if they've noticed they're having a problem in their area. So if a patient has gone to their GP and, said, and they've said, we can't remove the wax, um, they can enter their postcode and it will help us collect a bit more of an idea of what's going on. Um, as kind of Cass has mentioned, it is quite, there's different processes in different pathways all across the country. Um, but this will help give us a bit more of an idea of what's going on. Um, and there's also another letter template. So this one is for patients who have had problems um, getting wax removed. So they can uh, fill in kind of the information about what's happened to them. They can talk about their personal experience and then send that letter to their GP. Um, at the moment, these options are for patients in England only. So for those of you in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, um, it would be best to direct your patients to uh, our information line. And there are more details about that on the next slide. So um, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got this web page. The link for that is on this slide here. Um, and our work will be determined by the actions that people take. So it would be really, really helpful if you could direct your patients to this web page so we can get some more information about it. Um, and sorry, sorry, I've been just looking at my notes. Uh, there's also information about information line there. So we've got two contact methods, email and phone number on this slide, but we also provide um, contact through live chat, text, and also a BSL service as well. Um, as with everything, we are really keen to hear people's feedback. So if you do see something on the page that you'd like to see back on or have any questions now, do let me know or feedback on our web page. I've also put my email on the slide there. Um, and then I think we've got the poll coming up now just to kind of quickly get an idea of, of what it's like in your area. So um, if you could do that, that would be really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, Frankie, uh, just while this is going, uh, we, we just lost you for a few seconds there, and um, oh. I'm not sure how much it was about, something about, we, we caught, when you came back in, it was about BSL. <laughs> oh, of course. So um, we have uh, our information line, which is a national helpline for people to contact if they have any problems, so um, relating to things like employment or healthcare. Um, oh, I've just seen the results of that poll. Wow. Um, that's not surprising, but it's really, really helpful to see it. Sorry, I'll go back to the information line. Um, we've got various different contact methods that people can use. So while I've put on this slide that you can contact us by email or phone, we have recently set up a BSL service as well that BSL users can contact us through. Um, so yeah, there's different ways to access our information line. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Frankie. That's that's really useful. And I hope everybody gets involved in this because I think we need to campaign to to make sure there is access and and you know to look at ourselves as well in what we can do. Perhaps I know some services do provide this, some don't. But is this something that you know we can can look at for the future? And perhaps we can put something together about working with the commissioners on this. Yeah, just want to say thank you very much for the AA and your, all your support with this as well. So thanks for letting me have some of your time. OK, thank you very much. So uh, I'm going to hand you over now to um, the EDI committee. Um, so this is Samantha Leah, who's going to update you on what's been going on there. Hi, Kath, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Hi, you. Hope. 
Oh, brilliant. It's always a worry. Um, yeah, so it's been a funny year all round, hasn't it? Um, so last summer's events really led to board receiving an open letter about um, BAA's approach to diversity and obviously it's really made us think. Um, so it's led to quite a lot of discussion and debates within board about how to respond. Um, and we wanted to do something really meaningful rather than just a sort of knee jerk reaction. So we started off by meeting with Jill Scott, who's a diversity expert, and just discussing what our next steps might be. Um, and all this is summarised in an article in this month's magazine, if anyone wants to read about it. So you'll have noticed as a kind of an emergency letter measure, um, we tried to make the board elections a bit less prone to bias and removed photos and names and um, we did get feedback about this and I think everyone appreciated our efforts but we're kind of aware that we didn't get it quite right so obviously that's something we'll be considering how we can do that next time. So since all this we've formed a new working group um, and I'm the board champion for it um, and we are all committed to improving the approach for equality, diversion, diversity and inclusion for BAA and we've got a really wonderful group of new volunteers. So first of all, we're very keen to take forward collecting information about the characteristics of our membership. And we started this a while ago, but it's been delayed due to fear of various quite big things. Um, but we'll be collecting that data soon when people sign up to become a member, when they um, refresh their membership. And also we might even send out reminders for people just to fill it in anyway. We also plan to send out a survey which will sort of concentrate really on EDI and accessibility to BAA for all our members. So it'd be really grateful if you could fill that out when it comes and encourage everyone in your departments to fill it out. So we really plan to embed the principles of EDI into everything that BAA does, all its activities, uh, including things that's using much more diverse images, um, looking at considering diversity of speakers at conference, um, looking at access, accessibility of our offering to all members, including members with hearing loss, which is something we realise we're not doing well enough. We've obviously tried this morning to get captions, but not quite got it right, but we are very aware we need to. And also looking at um, just opening up, up and being more transparent about the process of how to volunteer for BAA committees and boards because we realise because there aren't necessarily examples of people from diverse backgrounds on board that people then think that they don't um, committee or board isn't for them so we're going to open up how we recruit. Um, so really just want to say just contact us of anything if you have any questions or suggestions if you have any experiences you want to share, just contact the BAA.audiology email. And we'd still welcome a few more volunteers. Here's a picture of the volunteers that were on the last meeting. We're planning to meet again in about two or three weeks. Um, so if you are interested in volunteering for that or have any suggestions of things we can consider, please get in touch. And that's, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, Sam. Let me just get my camera back on. Okay. So uh, I'm just going to now cover um, the high training scheme. Um, you know, at one point, BAA were considering um, sort of pulling out of this, but then after members um, polled us, they wanted us to continue with it. Um, we went back to back to it to have a look to see um, how feasible it was and what we could do. So the the team who've been working on this. Uh, have been brilliant and, and they really work very hard. Um, so they, there's a small committee of them. They've produced final drafts of the new updated higher training scheme module and that's going to be launched on the 1st of April this year and we would welcome feedback from all the membership on it please. So the modules they've changed slightly so they'll come in three, three different sizes <laughs> depending on the minimum number of clinical sessions required during training and they're going to be split into nine different areas. So the table shows the new modules. Okay. So we're going to look at paediatrics, balance, uh, adult auditory assessment and rehabilitation. Okay. So um, 
And here you can see on this table uh, the different, so the small, medium and large modules that go with it. Okay. So the proposed content of each of these modules, can, the, you can find these in the module specifications, which you can find on the website, um, the, in the news pages. Feedback, please, should be given using the feedback form, so they produce a feedback form for you. And please can you email all feedback back to BWA by the 12th of February, so that's a, a few weeks off, a couple of weeks off now, uh, by 12 noon, and then they can have a look at that. So we do want your input into this. I mean, there was a lot of talk about the previous um, modules that used to exist and how relevant they were. So we, I think the, the group wanted to make these quite relevant for um, people in service who want to do the higher training scheme. So this is another option. Um, you know, if, you can't, if people can't do the STP either as a direct entrant or an in-service entrant, the higher training scheme gives uh, audiologists uh, the option to, to progress in the career. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, um, I'm going to pass you over to Saira Hussein, who is our Early Professionals Director. Now, Saira is a really, really, really good example of an early professional. So um, she, Saira um, did the uh, BSc in Audiology and she uh, did the STP and she spent her three years with me in Manchester and then went on to uh, get a job at Aston University as a lecturer. And since then, she's become a director of the um, of, of the um, PTP. I don't know if it's STP modules, but she's uh, she's certainly um, gone a long way now in Aston. So, I'll hand you over to Cyrus. I'll turn me off. Thanks, Kath. <laughs> oh, sorry about my lighting. Um, I think it's just the the morning sun. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. I will continue. So, Kath, I believe may be biased, but yes, I did the, P uh, S the BSc, the STP, and I am now the Programme Director for the MSc Clinical Sciences, which is the Master's component of the STP at Aston. University of Manchester also offer this. Um, I just wanted to give a really quick update in terms of the Early Professionals um, Committee. So we met last week for the first time with a group of very enthusiastic, driven and ambitious um, BAA members. We have got a few from different universities as well as graduates. We've got the SCP, the Standard Root MSc, PTPs, um, you name it, <laughs> we were almost there. And I believe we should be covering um, foundation degree um, as well with a member. They have lots of ideas and I'm hoping we can try and get content out soon. And the reason why I'm sharing this with you all today is we want to encourage and support our early professionals. There's no cutoff point of what an early professional is, but we are aiming this towards um, current students and graduates. Um, at the start of their journeys and you may become an early professional all over again if you decide to take on the HTS or the STP for example. We aim to create a range of posts, videos um, and have a sense of um, a BAA early professionals network in some context and hope to have these materials for you soon. Um, as I've said, there is no cutoff point, so please do encourage any of your uh, trainees and graduates that you have, um, especially any of the new, newly qualified um, graduates through COVID and possibly this year's intake as well that may need some support. Um, my last um, comment is just on student placements. We understand that the pandemic has limited what all departments are able to offer, and some of that may not be at sort of your, a local level, it may be at a trust level, for example. Um, if there is anything that you can provide to your um, students, um, please do get in touch with your higher education institutes, even if it's a short placement, um, but this can also include anything set up online. So for example, online tutorials, any um, demonstrations, any sort of journal clubs, study clubs, anything like that, 
that you think you're you may be able to provide um please do get in touch with your university links as they would love to support um all students at this current time please do let me know if you've got any questions otherwise i'm more than happy for you to email me and please do encourage um everyone in departments to be BAA members if they're not already and let them know that there will be new content soon. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And just uh, on student placements as well, and, and just as, as um, students qualify, we are talking at the moment around preceptorship. So that's an ongoing uh, discussion that we're having at the moment. So if anybody has any um, feedback on that or they want to, to uh, give us some information or want us to go further, please let us know, won't you? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to pass you over to Susanna, who's our new conference uh, lead on board, and she can tell you uh, a little bit more on the conference and we're going to do a poll as well. Just bear with us. Um, Susanna's just having a technical issue at the moment. Okay, can anybody hear me now? We can, we can. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, it froze at the wrong time. Um, yeah, so we just wanted to give you an update about uh, where we're at with the conference, really. Um, so obviously last year, the face-to-face -face conference was rearranged and um, we went with a webinar series instead which was actually uh, went down really well and was really popular um just to let you know that we actually uh, rearranged last year so that we're still committed to manchester conference center for 2021 and 2022 um we're at the difficult position now where normally at this time of year we're we're quite far into starting to organize the, the conference obviously we're still in lockdown so um we, we need to make a decision really as a board um where we go with with this year's conference so um we appreciate that we can't predict what's going to happen in november um but we one of the factors we need to consider is whether people will actually attend so um we're looking at lots of things um with things like funding and what sort of costs are involved if we did rearrange anything but we did want to get some opinions today on how people felt about um, the thought of attending a conference face-to-face -face themselves, assuming it was COVID secure by November and that we were allowed to do that, and what the feasibility was of actually releasing staff to come to a conference. So we were hoping to do a couple of quick polls today just to get an idea um, of what people were thinking. So hopefully you can still hear me because I keep cutting in and out. But um, Victoria, if you're there, if you could yeah, put the first poll up, thank you. So um, obviously it's a bit of guesswork, but we appreciate that. But if face-to-face -face meetings were allowed again by November and it's booked at the moment for the 18th and 19th of November, could you please answer for us whether you consider um, yourself attending the annual conference if it was face-to-face -face this year? Okay, so we got so we expected quite a few maybes. We appreciate it's quite difficult to know, so that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, and the second question we'd like to ask is, um, again, if face-to-face -face conferences were were safe and we were allowed to do that, um, what's the feasibility if you actually sending uh, people from your teams, um, actually releasing them to go to a conference? So again, it's yes, maybe or no, please.
Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, so we've got obviously a bit of decision making to do with um, considering lots of other factors, but that's really useful to help us make that decision. Thank you very much. That's all from me if there's no questions about the conference. Okay, thank you very much, Susanna. Um, what we're going to do now is to to look at um, the week of webinars that we did, the wonderful week of webinars. So um, I hope a, a number of you attended these. I certainly got on as many as I could do. Uh, we had 21 in total and um, nearly 1,500 registrants on them and over 1,000 attendees. We had 28 digital posters, which were fantastic. And we had four recorded webinars. So this is where people recorded them before we, we presented them. And we had seven awards. Okay, so we look at the next part of this. So this is just considering that, you know, we did this as online and this is something that we, we have to sort of consider again this year, just in case. So the webinars that we did, they're all available on demand uh, to view on the website. So if you missed any, please go and look at them. And there are some really, really good webinars on there. We had two uh, members of data on career development. We had two on tinnitus, two on implantable devices, two paediatric ones and one adult rehab. Um, we had 12 in the November conference weeks, which, so which would have been the conference week and these were on genetics, behavioural science, music and hearing aids, changes to practice, CBT and hyperacusis with children, that was really good too, research and various sponsored topics. So it was quite a varied programme that was put together really at a very short notice. So uh, that was fantastic for, for the uh, conference team to do that. Um, and as well as the webinars that are available to watch again, the research posters are still there. So this is a good opportunity because normally we only see the research posters at the conference. Uh, but because we've got them now on the website, you can go back and look at them again. And I think they're a really good resource. So, um, you yeah, know, please, please do have a look at what's been going on in the research field. They're amazing. Uh, we had um, we had some really good feedback. So you can look at that. And then uh, we had the BAA Awards. So uh, these were the uh, winners um, this year. So we congratulate them. And please remember, uh, you know, please put forward people for the awards. You know, if you've got some really great people in your teams, um, please put them forward because we will be asking for nominations uh, this coming year for the next round in November. Um, yep. Yeah. It's, it's great. I hopefully that they will get the trophy soon. That was a bit of a logistical nightmare, of course, because normally we hand them out there, uh, but uh, we're having to post them this time. OK, so we'll have a look at that. So I just wanted just to quickly cover, as I know time is of the essence now, um, uh, membership benefits, because a lot of people say, uh, you know, what, what am I getting from BAA? Well, we try and work hard to to make sure that we refresh what we do, that we're doing new things, that we're listening to you all and listening to what you want from us. So everything, um, you know, everything that's a, a membership benefit is available on the website. Um, so it's a good way to encourage people to become members so they can access all these. So again, all the webinars, um, we've got access for, uh, to the 2019 conference presentations as well, the magazine contents in there, Horizons, which we put out to everybody as well. Um, there's been a lot on website development, so we're doing a lot more on that. There's going to be more resources. That's part of our thing about professional development. We want to put some more things on there, looking at training, um, different forms of training for everybody. Um, so yeah, there's an awful lot, lot going on. So how can you get involved? Well, you can share things with us. And, and that's the idea that, that you, you were, a, we're a whole community in audiology. It's good to share best practice, new things you've been involved in, things you think work well. So, so please encourage people to, to share that thing and encourage your team members to join BAA uh, if they're not already members. Write articles for the magazine. You know, you've got some good ideas. We want articles for the magazine. And students, you know, we want to we want to encourage a little bit more on to encourage our students to get involved. So, you know, get them to write about what it's like to be a student, 
Um, and also, you know, our assistants, don't forget our assistants. I know, uh, you, you know, that they're still part of our, our profession. Uh, we want to support them as well. And then don't forget this year, we do have, we will have some board um, members who will be stepping down. So do think about that. And we need additional people for our committees because these are the people that work really hard to develop all the plans that we put forward. So we have, we have a, a, a plan that goes over a few years, things that we want to do, things we want to develop, but we do need people to, to help us with that. So please get involved. Don't be, don't be frightened of getting involved. And it's a good way eventually then to, to step up into, you know, if you want to be on board, it gives you that, that insight into getting in there and what you can, what you would like to work on. Okay, so I'm, uh, we're going to talk about regional groups now because I know there's, um, we, we do have some uh, questions on that. So can I pass you over to Lauren? Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. We can. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so we, we have a few vacancies um, on our regional groups. So we are looking for people for Scotland, Northern Ireland, London, Anglia, East Midlands and the Southwest, because um, we've had quite a few people sort of step down um, for numerous reasons. Obviously, we were limited last year in, in how many regional events we were able to run, um, but we're hoping this year to, to get those back up and running, whether that be online or whether face to face is possible later in the year. Um, so if you could spread the news around your teams and if anybody is interested, just ask them to get in touch. Um, it would be a nice opportunity for them to, to get involved with BAA and, and hopefully organise something that, that would be useful for, for everybody in the local area. Um, so yeah, just, just get them to get in touch if they're interested. Thanks, Laura. Sorry, I called you Lauren. Sorry about that. Uh, so Laura Feingold's our um, board director that helps with the, the regional groups. So contact her, please do. Um, OK, I'll just put my camera back on now. So uh, I'm going to cover this. So Lizanne would have covered this, but she can't be with us today. So um, this is uh, something that we need to tell you about. If you haven't already seen it, we have put it out in social media as well. Um, so this is about registration and a possibility of merger of registers. Now we have been here before. So the RCCP, which many of us are members of, uh, they're at an advanced stage at the moment of negotiation with the Academy of Healthcare Science to merge these two registers and the, the other activities that they do, so the working activities. So they're currently consulting all the major professional associations in the world of clinical physiology on this proposal. So the next phase will be seeking the views of the individual registrants and the responses to this consultation is really important, okay? So I'll just give you a little bit, a bit of background on that. Um, so at the moment, uh, so, so um, the PSA, which is the Professional Standards Authority, has been reviewing uh, accredited registers. And there's 20 accredited registers um, in healthcare with 6,000 registrants. Um, so there's a pressure on the cost of maintaining these registers, so, which comes to about 11,000 pounds per annum per register. So there's a growing need for patients to have a clearer and simpler way of identifying uh, clinical physiologists seeking redress where necessary. So they've been discussing this for the past seven months. Um, as I said, we, you know, we, we knew um, about um, the possibility of this some years ago, but that actually it fell at the last hurdle, so nothing more was done about it. But they've now come back to the table to look at merging these again. The RCCP has a lim more limited role than the Academy of Healthcare Science. So they're looking at the viability and sustainability and they need the views of stakeholders, which is ourselves, if they're going to take this forward. So the proposal is a transfer of the RCCP register and all its functions to the Academy of Healthcare Science. They say this could better support the professionalism of all clinical physiologists under one regulatory mechanism and one set of standards. And they're saying the benefits could be increased clarity for stakeholders, including registrants, education providers and the public, increased cost effectiveness, increased influence 
and improve public safety. So the next steps is there's a full proposal document and that's going to that has a, a questionnaire link to it where you can provide views on the proposals. And um, this has been sent to professional bodies and all registrants. So all the feedback on the proposals will be considered before a decision is made and a summary will be published of the feedback they receive. So I attended a meeting on this and there were questions around the um, higher education institutes and who were going to uh, credit them if there was this merger. Summary accredited by uh, the Academy of Healthcare Science, some by the National School of Healthcare Science, some professions are not in healthcare science and some straddle other areas, so for instance psychology and education, but everything has to be cleared with the um, PSA first. Um, we ask questions on the M level courses and what will be accepted, um, you know, what, what's accepted now, um, what will be accepted in the new merged thing if that happened. Um, so please have a look at that. Uh, please give your feedback, it's really important um, because this is a, a big development if it's going to happen. And I know people have very different views on this, so you know, they need it. So, so please get them in there. Okay, thank you. Okay, so some general information for you before we uh, come to near the end now. So the scientist training program, so the curriculum uh, for, uh, for audiology is out for review. So for those who are involved in that, the, the National School of Healthcare Science is asking you to look at the curriculum and provide your feedback. because we're looking at some changes to the STP program. Uh, so this is a service, so it should take an hour, so put yourself time aside to do it. Uh, they, will, they want feedback from anyone with an interest in audiology, so share this with your colleagues. It isn't just for those who, who deliver the STP. Um, there's some other studies that are going on. Famous study, so this is adult NHS hearing aid services. So we're all being invited to take part in a study about the effectiveness of monitoring and follow-up of new adult hearing users, hearing aid users. Uh, so this is an opportunity then for NHS audiology services to work collaboratively to provide an evidence base for clinical practice. Uh, so the scale and scope of this is unparalleled in the UK audiology and it's going to involve the recruitment of a total of around 3,600 new adult hearing aid users across as many as 40 audiology services and it requires no previous experience in clinical research. So they're asking for um, audiologists in those service to, to help out with this research program. Um, I've got one of my uh, trainees at, at the moment looking at the 12 month um, reviews and another one looking at how we can um, use some data, uh, some data scoping to, to pick out, out these. And then don't forget Tinnitus Week, 1st to the 7th of February. Um, have a look on the BTA website as well. Uh, they want to make sure everybody who has tinnitus gets the right information from the right place at the right time and we are going to support that so we'll be making our tinnitus webinars open access for all during that week. So thank you very much. Okay so I think we've finished more or less on time. Thank you everybody for attending today. Uh, we are looking and we'd like your feedback uh, to have a members um, session at some point this year uh, before conference, of course. Uh, if there's anything you want to ask, please, uh, please do so. Have we had any other questions, Victoria? There's just a couple popped in, Kath. Um, there's one, um, what is being done about the lack of apprenticeship route for level four HCS or level five FD to the level six BSC PTP? Okay, so right, okay, so that that's something we will discuss, and and I know this is a a, um, a challenging one because I've had the same problem. So I have an uh, associate uh, who we've been trying to get on the BSc for four years now, and we've finally finally done it. Um, it's taken a bit of negotiation with the apprenticeship teams because audiology is sort of way down at the bottom of the the ladder for that. So uh, we will we will look at it. Um, with the education, but I'll, I will come back to you with that. I'll ask some of the questions because Lizanne and Tim might have a little bit more um, to up update on that. Okay, there's a question on prescribing. Where is BAA in moving this forward? Right, okay, so there is, uh, I know that there's uh, a small group chatting about this. 
so that they put out the um the questionnaire didn't they i hope everybody had a chance to um feedback into that so hopefully Jadjit Seti uh, will come back to us on the outcomes of that um, process uh, on what happened there. Um, and this is about uh, advanced clinical practice. Uh, so at the moment, I don't know any more about that. I just know that it's that they've done the scoping practice. So uh, as soon as we get anything back and um, um, feedback from that, we'll, we'll come back to you on it. But we're hoping we, to, to push this forward. There's a question on school screening. Is anybody aware of a national approach to catching up with school screening? There isn't one. There's no national approach at school screen at the moment because it's commissioned locally. So it's, there's no there's no national there's no national guidance on it at the moment. It is still commissioned locally. That some areas do it, some areas don't do it. So it's a very it's a very hit and miss. Uh, there's one uh, question on HTS where we may have to go back to the HTS team to get some information, but uh, the comment is good news on the HTS. One criticism of the previous system was the consistency in the examination process. What work is being done to ensure examiners are well placed to assess consistency and appropriate to the new HTS rather than how they were perhaps assessed in the past? I don't know if you want to comment, Kath, or if we get back from Helen. Yeah, I, and I know that is part of what they're looking at as well. And about accrediting um, assessors, so so that that is in process, yes. But we can come, um, we can we can get some comments on that. We'll come back to people. Uh, perhaps we might put something on the website about it as we as we go on. Yeah, sure. There's a, a question also on the COVID backlogs. Is there a national approach for dealing with COVID backlogs? I'm not sure what everybody else has been doing, but it's been there's been quite a pressure, I know, for services to get back to pre-COVID levels, which is very difficult. I'm um, sure you're all aware of that. Um, I mean, we've been working in different ways. Um, I know that, you know, certainly my trust is quite keen for us to get back to, to that level, but it, it's, 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 it's a slow process. I don't think there's any national process at the moment, uh, but if anybody else wants to comment, certainly we can share that, uh, what, what people have been doing to try and get back up to the the previous levels but we've all had we you know it's it all stems from that early shutdown um which we haven't done this time because we've got things in place so um yeah whether the the trust will will the money provided to do some uh, additional uh clinics i'm not sure as a comment come in there's a lot of work going on directed from the cso in the midlands on covid recovery some okay. Um, are paediatric services completing DM01 and are they having issues trying to justify service, trying to justify services are not just diagnostic? There's a question just come in. Um, I mean, certainly if it is diagnostic, so, it's, so they should be completing DM01 if it is a diagnostic pathway. Um, I suppose there's some stuff around watch weight and bits and bumps like that. Um, we can look certainly look into that further. Um, if people think a national approach to um, school screening would be a good idea in the sense of uh, the other comment around should school screen carry on, um, it's something I suppose we could look at potentially to say we think it should be, but um, we could issue a statement or that sort of thing if, if people had comments on it. Um, email us and we'll have a look at it and sort it out. There's there's quite a few number of questions in the question box. In there. what we'll do is for those um, question for a lot of those questions, because I'm conscious of the time now, uh, we'll we'll get together and uh, we'll put something up for you. Is there anything else that that Victoria, do you think that we that's important there? I th well, I think we've asked most of the questions. There's some comments coming in from people, so we can certainly yeah. share that information as well. We'll share all that, yes. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. And hopefully we'll see you again fairly soon. Bye for now.